see if I can. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. And um, I know there's at least a couple of folks here that have had, uh, they've got more history with Purple Martins uh, in, in and around Vancouver and Portland than I do. So, um, um, you know, maybe uh, when we get to questions after the, uh, the talk, they can kind of chime in with uh, what they might know about you know, the, uh, the local populations here. Um, my study has been down closer to Corvallis and, um, and uh, Benton County. Um, I'm going to uh, just start the talk by talking a little bit about the, uh, the biology, the natural history of the species. We'll talk about um, some of the limitations on martin populations and uh, eventually get around to talking about the work we're doing down on McDonald and Dunn Forest, as well as um, some conservation efforts uh, being done more, uh, more widely. So the, uh, the purple martin is uh, three subspecies in North America. The particular species here that we have in Oregon is called the western purple martin. And, um, it's the largest swallow in North America. It's probably one of the largest swallows in the world. And uh, I think it's one of the most beautiful birds that we've got in, uh, in the, uh, really the state. The, the males are this really gorgeous kind of indigo that's very glossy. Uh, they have this kind of babbling, um, melodious song. Once you've heard it, I, you know, I don't think you'll forget it. it and, um, it's just a, a bird that has captured the heart of a lot of folks in Oregon and across North America. And um, uh, so um, there's a lot of folks, mostly in the Midwest and, and back East, that are actually hosting entire colonies. And they've done it um, for, for many years. And there's a few folks here in Washington and Oregon that have been um, great stewards of uh, purple martin colonies also. So um, there's a, been a whole lot of public interest by birders and folks that aren't, wouldn't call themselves birders. So uh, this map shows kind of the distribution of the three species. The, uh, the eastern purple martin is, that, uh, is the blue area of the map. The red area of the map is the desert purple martin. Um, and it's a species that kind of has an affinity to nesting in saguaro cactuses. And then you see the little spots of green um, in uh, a little bit in the southwest, but mostly along the, the north coast of, uh, of the northwest states is really the, the um, the uh, center of the range for the western purple martin. And uh, then those lines just kind of show you the, the spring migration. And so they're just about to be showing up here in Oregon in the next couple of weeks. On our site in, um, at Corvallis, the, uh, the full adult males usually show up around um, the last week of April or so. Uh, oh yeah, the, the, so, and uh, all of these, these purple martins, they're, they're coming up here to um, North America to, to breed in the summer. And uh, with just really recently in the last decade, we've been exploring where they go in the winter. Um, there's been a lot more research done in the east. But uh, Bruce Cousins and uh, some other folks that mostly have been working with Purple Martins in British Columbia put these little geolocator tags on some birds uh, that were um, uh, breeding on the British Columbia coast. And with these little tags, they were able to follow their winter migration. And um, as far as we can tell, all of these, the um, Martins from our region, they head down to the southwest or uh, a little spot in Mexico, and they rest there for about a month while they're completing their, um, their malt, malt. And then they all book down to a little site in, um, in Brazil on the coast, and it's actually kind of an industrialized site. And that's where all of, 
from all the evidence that we've got, is all of the birds from the Northwest are heading down to this very localized site in Brazil to spend the winter, which is kind of cool. Um, okay. So here's uh, the Oregon distribution, and uh, these are, this isn't a product of any research. These are just um, incidental sightings, mostly by birders in Oregon that are reporting to this online database called eBird. And you'll see from these sightings that um, uh, there's, uh, they're most frequently sighted in a, along the coast, kind of along uh, the lower Columbia, and then just scattered sightings all around the Willamette Valley. And, um, you know, these really, um, these really amount to just dozens or maybe a few hundred observations a year. There's, uh, there's a couple of um, major uh, colonies at some Army Corps of Engineer reservoirs in the, the Cascades and then at Ferdinand Ridge down at uh, near Eugene. And uh, just kind of scattered sightings uh, throughout the rest of the Willamette Valley in the summer. So, um, so the, the birds come up uh, in the spring from South America and the males and females just form a temporary bond for that just lasts for one breeding season. They don't have a, a whole lot of fidelity to one another. They, um, uh, both the, uh, of the pair, the males and the females have different chores in rearing the young in the summer. The, the females do most of the incubation sitting on the nests. Uh, the males tend to do the nest site guarding and uh, they all share in, they both share in feeding the, the young. Um, we kind of suspect that the ancestral populations that lived in the forest before they, before humans were putting out a lot of artificial nest sites, that they probably never reached the, the colony sizes that we see, see today where, um, where they've been uh, kind of adopted by humans who have put out hundreds of artificial gourds or, or houses. We'll, we'll see colonies of, of more than a hundred pairs. Back um, in their native habitat, it was probably just um, a pair or two that had an inhabited a burn and um, they never, it was never more than a half a dozen or a dozen birds at, at uh, any one time during the summer. And there is certainly some advantages to that kind of uh, strategy. These huge purple martin colonies are really attractive to all kinds of predators. And so by thinning out their popular, the, you know, thinning, thinning out their breeding populations at, at lower densities, they're probably less likely to get munched by owls and mammals and, and other predators. And uh, so we don't know a whole lot about habitat selection in, you know, in natural environments. Mostly what we know of purple martin habitat use is from populations that have been, um, been reared for generations in uh, artificial nests. Um, and so we, you know, we've got some early data uh, and we can speculate about what they were using before humans were putting out gourds and, and wood nest boxes. They most likely were, um, you know, showed some affinity with uh, forest fires and uh, early successional forests where um, a wildfire would come through the Cascades or the uh, portion of the coast range and they would leave really hundreds and hundreds of snags and uh, this, these are great habitat elements for not only purple martins, but you know, a lot of woodpeckers and other cavity nesting birds, as well as fishers and all kinds of other species. And so we kind of think that purple martins were probably adapted to following these, um, these young successional forests. And when their snags got overtopped, they would um, go look for a new burn. Um, and, uh, and uh, so the, 
the places we see them in, in contemporary landscapes along the coast and the Columbia River, Fern Ridge Reservoir, you know, these are just probably kind of later adaptations and uh, new habitat selection. And purple martins are a species that take to human housing really, really, um, you know, quite quickly. So just a, a little bit um, about foraging. They, um, they're foraging much higher than most other species of uh, swallows and swifts, up to 150 meters. They're probably, because of their larger size, they might be selecting larger flying invertebrates um, than some of the smaller swallows. And so things like uh, damselflies and, and uh, uh, dragonflies probably are a large part of their, their habitat and um, they, they don't forage in rain because there's just fewer insects up there and the, the energy it takes to, to feed in rainy weather is it just kind of, uh, uh, it takes more energy to forage than they get from actually the, you know, any food that they would, they would gather. And so when they're coming back in April and early May, it's, it's a very tenuous time for martins. Um, you know, they're getting regular showers. It's, it can get cold. And so we see, um, you know, we see so, quite a bit of uh, martin mortality in, in spring and early summer when the weather is a little bit unstable. So, um, this map, it's a little bit confusing, but what it's kind of showing is the North America trend of Martin populations uh, from 68 to, to 2010. And so where you see blue, those are areas where um, we've got survey data that indicates that Martin populations are increasing. Where you see uh, red, We've got um, areas of the country where we're seeing decreases in population. Um, and then the orange and yellow are kind of, kind of stable. And um, the thing is, is this, so this data comes from the uh, breeding bird surveys, which is, um, it's a great source of information, but it's a kind of imprecise. These uh, breeding bird routes are kind of widely scattered. And, um, and then we have to recognize that most of, almost all of these birds that are getting surveyed, these are, these are colonies that are being maintained artificially by humans. And these are not um, uh, martins that are living in, probably for the most part, are not living in, in natural settings. And so, um, you know, it, gets a, it gives a little skewed of a picture of, of how we're doing, and I think it's it's a little bit more optimistic uh, than we're actually seeing if you kind of discount the fact that most of these are are breeding in artificial settings. Um, yeah, and then really the the most serious declines that we that we saw with the purple martins, you know, in in recent times was back in the uh, the '60s. The European starling really is pretty new in Oregon, you know, it's just, it's really been exploding since the, the 60s. And, um, and it's just been following that invasion that we've seen um, pretty dramatic uh, uh, decreases in starling populations in Oregon and, uh, and much more serious in Washington and, and uh, California. So this just is kind of a list of some of the governments and conservation organizations, how they are considering the, the conservation status of the martin. And uh, in, the st in Oregon here, it is considered a, a state sensitive species and a conservation strategy species. Um, these, are, these are designations by um, Oregon Fish and Wildlife that kind of elevate the, the conservation status of martins. They don't have any regulatory protection. Martins have the same 
same protection that any other native wildlife species gets. You, you can't harass them, you can't capture them without a permit. Um, but there's no particular burden on private landowners that are hosting martens in a, in a, in a, a colony. And uh, it's a Fish and Wildlife Service species of concern, kind of a similar designation. The, the service is paying attention to it, but not devoting a great deal of resources like they would be investing into uh, federally listed threatened or endangered species. And then I kind of find it amazing that two of the major avian conservation groups, uh, Partners in Flight and American Bird Conservancy, Martins really aren't ranking very high on their radar. And I think it just, it, um, they believe that the species is secure because there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pairs that are successfully nesting in artificial habitats. Um, as a forest ecologist myself, I don't find that very satisfying, but um, they aren't going to be disappearing from the landscape anytime soon anyway. So uh, just kind of a quick discussion on the kind of the natural and unnatural factors that are limiting uh, martin populations. And they include the, the nest site competitors, um, you know, and so these are going to be the other swallows use cavities for nesting, you know, bluebirds. Um, you know, when, where the martins are actually using dead trees or, or snags, they're using the cavities excavated by woodpeckers. And it's the uh, northern flicker that produces a cavity for its own young that they only use for a year, and then those cavities are left. And it's, it's a particular suitable site for, um, for purple martins. And, uh, and everybody wants to use these, these scarce little tree cavities. And so in um, urban settings and parks, you see a lot of competition from starlings and, and uh, house sparrows. And out, out in more um, native looking forests, it's um, you know, it's wrens and swallows, uh, the, the other like tree swallows and violet green swallows. And then um, martin eggs and young are munched by uh, numerous kinds of predators. Owls have, uh, have, are particularly notorious predators of, of martins and swallows. And um, a owl that finds a colony can, um, can eliminate many, many nests over the course of the week and will actually cause the abandonment for years of a particular site. And uh, so we're pretty cautious about um, predator um, guards on our, uh, on our uh, gourds and um, protecting them also from mammalian, predator, uh, yeah, mammalian predators that, that could get up into the boxes also. And then the other kind of um, factor that's limit limiting martens and some other cavity nesting species is just the scarcity of snags that kind of occurred, well, almost since uh, World War II, uh, as tree harvest was kind of bumping up in the Co Oregon Coast Range and the Cascades, there wasn't a, an appreciation for the ecological importance of dead trees. and so. Um, um, in the processes of, of logging, all of those dead trees would go away. And it did lead to some decreases in cavity, um, cavity dependent uh, wildlife, including martens. Fortunately, under Forest Practices Act these days, um, they, um, on private lands and on state and federal lands, we, there are being a lot more snags um, retained. And so I think the outlook is actually pretty good for, for uh, martens on managed forests in the Coast Range and, and Cascades. So um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, spring weather is, um, is a notoriously precarious time for, um, for martens. And where um, folks have been monitoring martin colonies in the Northwest for 
I mean, there's, there's been some colonies monitored for up almost 20 years. And they can actually, they've got the data where a single severe storm in spring can lead to um, kind of a dip in the population in the region for, you know, up to five years. Um, and it's kind of, uh, I mean, the weather is beyond our control. It's, it's just unnatural environmental factors that um, they, they deal with. Uh, like pretty much all wildlife, um, martens are the um, hosts to plenty of different kind of parasites. And, uh, and uh, one of them is a nasty little bird nest mite. And um, the last couple of years when we've gone to do the gourd checks um, at our, our particular colony, by early August, the inside walls are absolutely, they're moving with these creepy mites. And they're all over the birds. And it got so out of control last summer that we actually, um, re we took out the, the little nestlings, we replaced all the nesting material, put, it, put them in clean gourds, and greatly reduced the, uh, the load of nest uh, mites that were uh, parasitizing them. Um, they, the birds can tolerate a lot of these ectoparasites, but at a certain point, um, they, they can cause uh, a lot of stress and, and mortality in the severest instances. So now getting down to the site where I've been working since 2011, this is McDonald Dunn Research Forest managed by Oregon State University. And it's uh, located just north of Corvallis. And so that kind of orange block on the map, that's the urban growth boundary of Corvallis. And then you'll see uh, the Dunn Forest is the green uh, block just north of that. The, it's uh, the OSU um, Research Forest. It's about 11,000 acres. And it occurs kind of right at the transition zone between the, the Coast Range foothills and the, the valley floor. And so this landscape is mostly forested, but right across the road is agricultural lands and, um, and quite a few kind of dense uh, rural residential neighborhoods too. And so this colony was kind of brought to my attention by local birders visiting it as early as like 2009 or 2008, I think. And, uh, our observation showed that the starlings were in, uh, posing increasingly severe um, nest site uh, competition for, for martens. And so we wanted to do something to allow this colony to persist. And what's really special about this colony is that they were still using snags. And out of all of the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of martin pairs using martin pairs that have been monitored in North America, there's only a handful, certainly less than 50, that are still using dead trees to nest in. The rest of the, the, rest of the North American population has completely switched over to artificial nest sites. Um, and so they're, they're dependent on human, um, human housing. And so to have a colony that's actually using snags in the forest in Corvallis is, it's quite a rare phenomenon. And, um, and it wasn't gonna be around long the way the, the starlings were encroaching from the agricultural lands and uh, from the, the rural residential neighborhoods. So our objective was to just, to throw the, this little colony a, a lifeboat, put out some starling resistant housing, let it persist, and hopefully improve the, the reproduction so that they can colonize all of these other clear cuts with a whole bunch of retained snags in, in the broader forest area. And so this is an aerial photo of the Dunn Forest Colony. The, this is the area where most of our, our work is being done. It's composed of two gourd racks, um, and the markers are really hard to distinguish. Um, but uh, just two of those red um, dots are gourd racks. A couple of them mark the locations of 
natural snags that martens are still using. And then a couple of others are indicating the locations where we have installed wood individual nest boxes. And you can see, it's, this is a really intensively managed forest landscape. Um, OSU does clear cutting, they do a lot of research, and nevertheless, um, the, the number of snags that they're leaving out there provides a whole lot of breeding opportunity for, for martens. And um, this is just, you know, kind of some on the ground photos of what the gourd racks look like. And uh, there you can see on the right some of the individual wood nest boxes that have been, um, they were donated to us by the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service res Refuge System. And it's those kind of boxes that are mostly being used on, on the Willamette Valley refuges. They've got a kind of a, a narrow slotted um, opening that is resistant to starlings. The burnt martens get in them just fine, as do the gourd racks. Uh, the openings are designed to permit swallows to get in them, but um, the uh, starlings can't squeeze in there. And uh, uh, it's, it's been just a great system. And here's a closer look. That's a female martin checking out one of the um, gourds that we had just installed in 2011. These are on um, an aluminum boom, and the, these gourd racks are just really slick. We're able to actually lower all of the racks of, and the gourds down to chest height. Each of the gourds has, as you can see, this kind of like wide, um, wide opening that's normally sealed with a, a threaded cap. And so um, for those of us that have in the past have had to climb on top of ladders, and in the case of some places on the coast and at Fern Ridge Reservoir to, to get to the Martin houses, they have to set up a ladder in a little boat and place it against a post to check their, their boxes. So we feel really, really lucky that um, we got a, a grant from Oregon Wildlife to purchase a couple of these gourd, gourd racks for using down at uh, Dunn Forest. Uh, they're predator resistant, they're starling resistant, they're really easy to keep clean. Um, and so they're, they're great. So these are some of the results that we're having with the, the artificial nesting that we're providing. Um, the wood boxes in the first three years of the project, they haven't been used yet. They're, they're being used by a lot of other species, but not martens. And uh, we, I have, in three years of observations, I've seen one martin try and get into one of these wood nest boxes, but was quickly evicted by a couple of uh, bluebirds that had already taken up resident. And, and we, we had extra capacity for martens, and so we, um, several of these uh, boxes are being used by, um, by bluebirds and other species, which is just great. Um, and it's really interesting that these gourds, so that photo on the, the bottom is a, from one of the, uh, the inside of one of the gourds where the uh, martens have started laying. And every one of the gourd nests are lined with oak leaves, which is, uh, it's kind of fascinating because oaks aren't a real common tree species in the local landscape. There's a few around, so the, the birds are, are out there actively selecting oak leaves to put into their, their cup nests, which is kind of interesting. Um, with the artificial gourds, we've had great success, unbelievable success, actually. Um, we put them out in the, I think it was um, February of 2011, we installed the gourd racks. I really didn't think they were gonna get used for the first year. Um, but one of them did, second year, four got used. The uh, last summer, six of the gourds got used. And what is absolutely remarkable is every single egg that's been laid in the gourd has survived to fledging. And for, um, for any bird species to have that kind of nestling success 
is really, really unheard of. So we're really happy with um, the productivity that we're seeing out in, uh, out in these gourd racks. And we're hoping that some of these birds are coming back to the forest and using snakes. That's an untested hypothesis yet though. And so this is just a few more photos of snags that are being used by, by um, martens in the forest. They're being, uh, so that one, the uppermost one was a Douglas fir snag that was actually deliberately topped off during the harvest unit and left as a wildlife tree. The, the middle um, photograph is a oak and it's near a, um, a road that's kind of a popular, um, popular trail in, uh, in Dunn Forest by recreational users. And so that was actually the first location that we became aware of, of Martins in the forest. Unfortunately, last year, the, um, the branch where the cavity uh, um, occurred for the, the ones being used by the Martins, it fell off in a winter storm. And so there's, we've got some boxes up there for, for Martins which aren't being used yet. And unfortunately, there's just no suitable other cavity in that snag being used. Uh, but there, there certainly are plenty of other dead trees available to them. And the bottommost for, photograph is of a big leaf maple left in a, like a 10 year old clear cut that's being used. Uh, just a little bit about the kind of the seasonality of activities. Um, you know, the the adult males, the two-year-old birds and older, they're they're arriving. They're the first ones to come back. Usually, um, we're detecting them around the the second or third week of April. They possibly might be arriving earlier, and we haven't detected them. And then uh, the the females and younger males, they're arriving a couple of weeks early. They get to pair formation and nest building pretty quickly by middle of June. And then, you know, things just kind of proceed and usually um, they're out of here. The, old bird, the oldest adults are leaving um, by the first week of August, they're gone. And some of the, um, the fledglings, the, the youngest birds, are hanging around these sites until mid-August or so, and then everybody disappears. So this is the McDonald Forest site, where we don't have much activity ongoing right now. We had actually started the project on Dunn Forest um, in 2011, before we actually became aware of this colony, and it was a a local wildlife biologist was just walking her dog out in McDonald Forest and she started hearing martins and so we we started exploring further and came across this old clear cut unit and um, the, the video is a clip of the kind of the landscape that is occurring in that what you see on the aerial photograph there and um, we haven't had um, enough we haven't had enough time to actually really do um, exhaustive searches out there, but you know our earliest observations kind of indicate that this might even be a larger colony than what we've been following over three miles distant in in, McDon uh, in Dunn Forest. We know there's um, the, these three, three sites that are indicated on the map that we've got another snag that we did find last year. Um, and there could be, it, it's a very large unit and there could be many more um, martens nesting there. So um, I think there's a lot of hope for these little colonies on the OSU research forests. And um, so um, others, other agencies are working on uh, martin conservation in the Willamette Valley. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers have been putting up these nest boxes at the large reservoirs um, it, that they've been managing and th the colony at Fern Ridge Reservoir is particularly large and, and well known. And uh, 
I think it's more on the order of maybe 120 pairs of martins that have been nesting at that reservoir for many years. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service refuges like Ankeny and, um, and Finley down by Corvallis, they are starting to put out nest boxes. I don't, um, there's, there was, uh, I think, the very first clutch that um, was noted on any of the f uh, wildlife refuges was in 2011, and then there's some suspected um, martin use of snags uh, down at Pigeon Butte, which is also on Finley near, near Corvallis. And then we do know of another um, colony down near Cottage Grove on Warehouser land. It's a, it's a clear cut where they retained quite a few snags. And um, there's a small colony of a few pairs uh, down there that were being monitored for a couple of years. Uh, I don't think anybody went out there in 2013 season to see if they're still there. Um, but, uh, um, and then there's all the, the ongoing, um, really private efforts along the Oregon coast, along the um, lower Columbia, where there's all kinds of boxes still available for martins. Uh, these are, some of the, um, you know, some of the other agencies that are involved in um, kind of the regional planning for uh, purple martins. And the biggest players are the Western Purple Martin Foundation and the Western Purple Martin Working Group. The working group is really, it's just a kind of a consortium of um, wildlife biologists affiliated with different government agencies in Washington and British Columbia and Oregon. Um, con concerned with purple martins as well as some just private property owners that have been hosting um, martin colonies for a number of years. And so we kind of all get together in the fall and kind of discuss the, you know, the productivity that we've seen, um, you know, what are the needs for conservation in the region, um, sharing banding observations. Um, and really it's that group that is where kind of all the information sharing um, gets, gets going. But, you know, like I said, it's, it's a bird that a lot of people have taken to their heart. And, um, and so we just see up and down the Columbia and along the coast, you know, private property owners just taking care of little martin colonies. And I think right now um, they are, you know, the, the private effort is just, um, been really crucial into making sure that we still have purple martins in Oregon and Washington. So um, this is you know, just as some of the other activities of monitoring and, and banding. Um, the British Columbia and um, Bruce Cousins and his colleagues in British Columbia have had a really intensive um, uh, Martin management effort in uh, along the coast of British Columbia for a number of years, 20 years I think. Um, here in the valley we banded our, although there's, there's been um, the colonies being hosted, the very first banding effort was by Joan Hagar uh, first in 2011 and these are the birds being um, reared in, in our Dunn Forest colony. And, um, and so these banding, uh, uh, the identification bands allow us to see where, you know, we're able to track where we banded a bird. You, almost always it's um, been taken out of a nest and been banded. And then by successive observations over the years, we can see where as adults they're coming back to, to breed. It's incredibly important information. And, it's, um, it's a contribution that folks that just happen to have martins in their neighborhood can be a part of. Because um, we're, you know, in, in the last few years, there's literally been thousands of martins that have been banded in, um, in Washington and in British Columbia mostly. And we've got very, very few um, band observations. And so the more eyes we have out there on the landscape, uh, the more information that we can get about where these, these 
martins are dispersing to after they leave their, their natal site. So um, keep your eyes open. And uh, I'd be able, uh, the, uh, myself and anybody at the Oregon Wildlife Institute would be happy to take your observations and, and share them with the other folks in the working group. And, um, you know, we really don't know this, the status of purple martins out in, um, you know, deeper into the coast range in the Cascades. These are landscapes where they're, they're mostly privately managed forests or some public forests. They're, they're places where, you know, there, there aren't biologists or even birders actually out there looking for, for martins or, or birding much. And so there are an increasing number of snags on managed forest and we'd like to get more folks out there looking and finding out whether martins are, are there. And if they aren't using the, some of these managed forests, then we really have you know, um, cause to be concerned. So th just some of the, you know, the, the research questions that still need to be dealt with as we're, we're trying to make sure that martins persist in North America. You know, um, where are they going after they li leave the nest? And, um, and that's what this banding data is all about. Um, we really don't know anything about how martins returning um, to their breeding, breeding range, how they're selecting what trees or landscapes to, to breed in. And um, that's really important information if we're, you know, we're concerned to um, providing them more nest sites. We need to know what they'd like. Um, and particularly, um, something we're really, really conscious of is whether martins that are being reared in artificial boxes and gourds, are we somehow contributing to this cultural shift that's happened back east that, um, that they're just going to get honed in on, on gourd racks and not even um, go back to snags when they become available? And so that's why um, we really need to do some of these studies and find out whether or not the birds that we're raising in the refuges and what we're doing are going back out to the forest. That's critical. So, And then uh, just what us at Oregon Wildlife Institute are going to be doing in the next couple of years, um, because we don't have this question answered on the, the impact that we might have to the shift, shift of habitats or nest site selection. We'll leave these gourd racks out there to, like I say, throw the, the colony a lifeboat. Um, we've got right now a capacity of um, something like, I think, 35 boxes and gourds. That's all we're going to give them at McDonald Dunn Forest anyway. And we're hoping as the density gets up and the artificial sites get saturated, they're going to start seeking snags out into the forest and clear cuts. And there's plenty of them out there. So, um, But um, we may look into um, partnerships along <coughs> um, sites closer to the Willamette River. Um, so this, these are kind of unforested areas closer to the valley floor. The pressure on, um, on martins from house sparrows and starlings is, is really, really intense. And they just might not be able to persist in the light of all of that competition in, um, in the valley floor. And so perhaps we're going to need to continue to supplement them with artificial housing. And, we need to be out there continuing to monitor and answering some of these research questions. Um, again, the um, Oregon Wildlife Heritage Foundation was um, really instrumental in getting this off the ground. They gave us the grants for the equipment and, and uh, to do some of the labor. Um, Joan Hagar of US Geological Survey, um, she's been doing all of the banding as well as editing my notes and a, a lot of other contributions. And the Willamette Valley uh, refuges donated nest boxes. Um, we've had some 
volunteer students coming out to help with observations. So it's been, uh, it's really been a village that has been involved in helping Purple Martins in Benton County. And that's it. If we've got time, be happy to answer questions. Sure. Yeah, that's great. I think it's easy to get that impression because in recent history, that's where, that's where the available cavities have been. Um, you know, bef you know, earliest, um, they were using, you know, cavities that were um, in poorly uh, preserved pilings, you know, docks on the coast. And, um, and so there was, as the, the valley and, and the Martin populations, I think, were decreasing in the coast range, um, they were finding these, these pilings that had cavities, and so there was this shift out to the coast. Um, Eric Horvath and others were putting boxes out for them out there, and um, Dave Fouts along the Columbia River and, and others. And so there's been this association recently with water but I think, you know, the ancestral populations were following wildfire. And then my comment, thank you, that, that makes sense, and I, and I agree with that. And my comment is, is on, uh, I want to reiterate the uh, importance of the bird banding and um, the birders in the, in the room here want to be looking for, for those because um, we need to turn those into the SGS bird band lab for, That's right. for the master database. Yeah. And you get a postcard saying, telling you where that bird was born and when it was born and who tagged it. We found one last year um, up in Washougal that was yeah. uh, nine years old and was standing on South Island. So we were really excited. Yeah, nine that. years old is getting up there. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the, the, the working group has come up with a, uh, a color scheme for the, for the western populations of Martins. All the martins that have been banded in the Willamette Valley have a red leg band. Um, what are they up in green? And uh, California, do you recall? It's, yeah, so there's, there's a color code. And so if we can get an observation of, you know, a martin color band uh, from where you live or wherever you see one, it provides us great information. We can link that back to where the bird came from. But then when you call that in, having been there, they say, what's the numbers? <laughs> and you, so the first thing is to yeah. find the band. Yeah. And then come back with your spotting scope and, yeah. and sit. Yeah. Because there's a letter and three itty bitty little numbers on yeah. that leg. Yeah. Which is pretty no. It, and, and, and it's uh, not all on one side, so you got to kind of hold it. Yeah. So we had our first band return at our colony last summer. And uh, so that's right, they get a color band on one leg and then they get a little aluminum ba band from the, uh, the banding laboratory on the other leg that has got a unique ID number. And my wife was able to sit out under that gourd rack with a spotting scope and read all of the numbers. I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> um, good birders with good eyes, they can, they can do that, um, yeah. Um, on the uh, issue of the mites, how do you clean the nest of mites? Well, um, that, that was really scary to me, <laughs> to, um, you know, taking out all of that nesting material. I hadn't done it before, but I knew that this was a really serious infestation, so I called, uh, um, Bruce um, advised me a lot, and, you know, he said, um, well, they're, they're pretty um, uh, resilient little creatures. And so we just lowered the rack. We had um, clean gourds that had been empty, hadn't been previous used. We put in some 
shavings as nesting material and we just switch the nestlings out of one gourd into another and put them back and it caused no problem at all. And in fact, when we went back to band the birds two weeks later, it was a greatly reduced load of mites. Um, And then, so those b gourds came back and th uh, they got cleaned with bleach and scrubbed out and they'll probably be going out again this year. Yeah. Are you me? Yeah. Uh, the nesting material, you put shavings in. Do you yeah. put twigs at all? We didn't. Because they seem to use twigs a lot to handle you. Yeah. Um, I was, I just put, I put cedar shavings and I know that's a little bit controversial, um, but I just put about a small amount, maybe a cup, an inch or so of shavings in the bottom. And then on top of that, the Martins would build a cup of, you know, pretty coarse twigs. And at our site, these oak leaves, you know, so it's not, um, you know, it's not a, carefully crafted nest, as you know. Yeah. Some have said you can be leave and nest to keep the pesticides down. How do you feel about that? I, I'd really be hesitant to be using any kind of pesticide in the nest. And I mean, my experience was by just changing out the nest material, you know, of the, the six gourds that we changed out last summer without a single problem with the nestlings, that just seems like a much safer bet. Pesticides, I thought that was a natural DDE? DDE. Diet D yeah, diatomaceous earth. Oh, diatomaceous earth. I don't know. I don't have any experience with it. Yeah, what we're using now in Sun Island seems to keep the pesticides mm. down. But you read that it was. Yeah, I read online that it could cause lung issues because. It's, it's really, really fine powder, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> yeah, I just can't speak of it. Yeah. yeah. So where did you guys get your uh, uh, the gourd structures from? Uh, did you guys make those, or is, is there a company that you're ordering those from? We ordered them from um, the kind of like the, the nationwide Purple Martin Conservation Group. It's the uh, Purple Martin Association. They've got an online store, and they sell multi-unit houses. They sell um, everything you could ever want for starting your own little Martin colony. And you, and you guys are pretty happy. I mean, that, from a maintenance standpoint, that seems pretty slick versus a flatter boat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, it's for maintaining and banding and all of that. They're really slick. They aren't using them on the Fish and Wildlife Service refuges because they're um, not very aesthetically pleasing. They, you know, they like the wood, more natural look, but somebody's got to get up there on the ladder and it's, you know, we can, we can check all, of, all six guards on one of these racks in just a couple of minutes. Can I ask one more question here real quick? Uh, uh, from a land manager standpoint, when you don't have a lot of uh, snack creation, uh, is there a prescription for snack creation that works particularly good for these little creatures in the, in natural areas, or, or is it just, you know, that we can create snags? So, um, is there, um, from our, what we've been observing, they're using pretty, I mean, relatively small branches in, like, hardwood trees of, like, maybe... 12 inch diameter is, is probably enough. They, they like to be out in the open. And so um, that's why um, the, the trees that have been retained like out away from the clear cut edge, kind of like more into the middle of the clear cut, those are the best spots. And there's, um, you know, most indications is, is that they won't penetrate a forest canopy. I mean, there, there's been some anecdotal evidence that they will um, continue to go below a forest canopy if it's a site that they've already known about. 
but um, they aren't going to be going into a forest canopy looking for new, new sites. Um, so yeah, at uh, Dunn Forest, these were all you know, trees that had been left on uh, after the harvest and have just been worked on for a few years by woodpeckers and then those sites become available for a lot of other birds. Any more? Yeah. Now, of course, in the cavities, not, not the nest, but the cavities, you're going to have a problem with the starling again. Yeah. Can you overcome the tendency to, oh, why don't we go out there and trap some starlings? Uh, you could. So it's not in McDonald and Dunn Forest. Um, the, the starlings are just... So our colony is right at the edge of the forest. On the other side of the road is, is agricultural land. And so that's where the, the starlings were. If you go 200, 300 meters a little bit further into the forest, and we, we don't see starlings. And so, you know, on OSU research forest, it's not a big deal. But if we want to see starlings more widespread across the valley floor, then yeah, snakes, they're just all taken over by, um, you know, by sparrows and, and starlings. Uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce Cousins, who's been in this a whole lot longer than I, said, has said that in the larger colonies, um, you know, martins can successfully defend their nests from starlings, that the starling, the, the Martins will just mob and mob and mob the starlings, and very often in large colonies, they can, they can repel starlings. Um, in a lot of cases where you, they're just, um, you know, individual snags here and there in the forest, um, that's not, that's not going to happen. Yeah, we're from Staggerwald over at, at uh, Washington yeah. just across the river. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of agricultural land. The only place I've seen the snarling or seen the uh, purple martins in the snags has been in cottonwoods, and there they're getting harassed by the snarling. Yeah. But we've also got 32 boars, and you don't see snarlings in there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I would like to mention one caveat that you, when you research purple martins, you'll find houses, apartment houses, that are aluminum. And that, I'm new to this area, fairly new to this area. I came from an area where we had the eastern purple martins. They love the houses, but out here they don't. That's and right. So don't buy. Don't buy. Don't buy, don't, don't spend money on the big martin houses, gourd racks or individual boxes. Yeah. Um, any last questions? Thanks for joining us, people. Thank you.